just very briefly at one kind of aspect of memories that we don't talk about very often, and that is forgetting memories. Um, how and why it is that we forget things, and uh, kind of that whole process and, and the importance or problems with it. So um, the process, is, process of forgetting, we should look at it honestly as kind of evolutionarily advantageous. Uh, and the reason for that is that <clears throat> if you think of everything it is that you encounter on a daily basis, if you absorbed all of that, it would be overwhelming. It would be too much information coming at you. It would be an information overload in which you were unable to uh, process through and sort out important versus unimportant things. So we should look at forgetting as being actually a good thing overall and evolutionarily advantageous for us as human beings. Because what we do is we oftentimes unknowingly, mostly unknowingly, right? We classify and create a hierarchy of important versus irrelevant information and <clears throat> we get rid of the irrelevant information in order to clear room for more information that will uh, help us in our lives and we also get rid of that irrelevant information in order to strengthen the relationships we have with relevant information it helps us then access that stuff more quickly it helps us uh, deepen our understanding of those memories and strengthen those bonds so we can better access it so really it is kind of important for us to forget as kind of odd as that may seem it is important for us to forget and when we talk about forgetting there's one name that really stands out as kind of being the father of the study of forgetfulness and that's herman ebbinghaus and ebbinghaus creates something called the ebbinghaus forgetting curve where he charts he himself memorizes <clears throat> some absurd number of nonsensical words just strings of letters together that he memorizes and then he tries to test himself to see how many of them he remembers and what he finds is that there is this initial drop in uh, his memory within the first few hours so there's this precipitous drop off in those first few hours when he's trying to remember things uh, and then it kind of plateaus and levels out a little bit and because of this, Ebbinghaus determines that most forgetting occurs very rapidly after we learn something. And part of that is, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, but a huge part of that is the fact that we just choose what we deem relevant and what we encode into our long-term memory versus what we just kind of <clears throat> let disappear and decay. So um, we find that there is this precipitous drop-off at the beginning, but then it plateaus as the days go by, and information that we've retained after a few hours, we tend to retain for a long time. Uh, although the Ebbinghaus curve is important in the study of psychology, it's certainly not the be-all, end-all, or the Bible. Uh, the fact that he used nonsense syllables to memorize kind of may skew this data. It may make it harder for us to use because... Um, memorizing something that is just entirely made up is more difficult than memorizing something that is personally relevant to us. So while <clears throat> Ebbinghaus's, Ebbinghaus's forgetfulness curve is important to us, <clears throat> it's definitely worth taking with a grain of salt, uh, making sure that we don't subscribe to it entirely. There are things that we use to me measure how much we forget or remember. You can use those terms kind of interchangeably. And the main term we use is retention. Retention tells us how much of what proportion of material we retain um, <clears throat> that we actually remember. And then another term that we'll see used often that's thrown around is called retention interval. And that's the amount of time that passes between when information is presented to us and when we're asked to uh, measure how much of that we've forgotten. So if you're introduced to a concept on a Tuesday and then on Saturday you have... Uh, you're asked about it that those number of days is known as your retention uh, <clears> or <throat> the retention interval. So uh, there are three main measures that we use to determine uh, how much we've forgotten and those are recall, recognition, and relearning. And recall is simply you are asked a question and without any cues, without any prompts, you have to reproduce that information on your own. <clears throat> you are not given any prompts from which to uh, help you draw that information, you just have to draw that information on your own. This would be like an open-ended question, right? <clears throat> One where you have to produce your own answer. The next is recognition, and recognition requires um, people to choose the correct answer out of a number of prompts given to them. So this would be like a multiple choice question. So if you've been given 
<clears throat> you've been asked to name the capital of California, and you've been given the options of San Diego, San Francisco, Sacramento, or Los Angeles, you have to <clears throat> recall which one of those, or you have to recognize which one of those, I should say, is the correct one based off of what you remember from information you've been given previously. And then the last one that we use to measure <clears throat> for getting or how much retention we have is what's called relearning. And that's where you're, you're, you learn something for the first time and then at a later date you are asked to memorize information again and measure how much quick how much quicker you're able to memorize it versus the first time or how many maybe it's not time but how many less um, times you see something uh, until you remember it so those are the three options recall recognition and relearning in terms of why we forget uh, there's a few reasons the first one that we'll look at is what we call ineffective code encoding and encoding, if you'll recall, is the process where we take memory and take it and put it from our short-term short -term memory into our long-term memory. And so ineffective encoding is where information is never really <clears throat> acquired. And we never really encode that information and put it into our memories. And oftentimes this happens because we're simply not paying enough attention. We're not actually paying attention to what's going on. So someone may be talking and you may be on your phone and you're saying, uh-huh, yep, nodding along. And you're not actually getting that information because you're not paying full attention. Therefore, you're not necessarily forgetting. This is why we call it pseudo forgetting because you never really acquired it and encoded it in the first place. So that's one of the reasons why we forget. Another one is, it's, it's a theory, it's called the decay theory. And the idea is that at, after a certain amount of time where we haven't done anything with the information we've been given, uh, we forget it. And so it's saying that the reason we forget is the passage of time. Uh, and that's the decay theory. And then the last one is interference. Um, and it says, it suggests, the interference theory suggests that people forget because of competition from other information. That is, uh, you are getting so much information that there's only room for obviously a finite amount. And so you've got to choose what you're going to remember and what you're not. So you forget information because there's competition in your memory for information. And there's two kind of types of interference. One is retroactive interference. And that is where um, new information impairs the retention of old information. So you learn something new and that takes the place of something you had learned previously. And the other is called proactive in, in, interference. And that's when uh, information you've learned before prevents you from learning new information. And that may be like a stubbornly held belief you had or something that you're absolutely 100% convinced of. And because of that, um, you're not really uh, open to new information. Uh, one last thing that we'll talk about briefly is this concept of motivated forgetting, which is also known as repression. Um, and the idea behind this is that people keep distressing thoughts and feelings that they have buried in their unconscious or their subconscious because they don't want to deal with it. And so, um, <clears throat> they, they bury it, right? It's, that's why it's repression. You repress your memories. You don't, you choose not to remember. It's motivated forgetting. You have a reason for forgetting it. And often these reasons are like completely valid. And in fact, not even often, these reasons are completely valid. Um, because it shows the repression happens generally with traumatic experiences that we have or experiences from high anxiety situations. And, uh, studies have shown that we tend to <clears throat> forget memories that induce anxiety. Um, more quickly than neutral memories. So we don't encode those as often because they create anxiety and anxiety is obviously not a pleasant feeling. And so we try to avoid it as much as possible. Um, despite this kind of information, there's still a lot that we don't know about repressed memories. And there's a lot of studies and kind of ongoing debate about how prominent a role uh, repressed memories really play um, versus how much can be attributed to um, suggestion, which is a dangerous thing to play because as we, as I mentioned, repressed memories often deal with super traumatic and anxiety filled moments. And so you don't want to discount what people have done or have had experienced to them. Um, but there is kind of this ongoing debate about how much repressed memory actually exists versus how much of it is kind of, some people call it overactive psychologists who are encouraging 
maybe some beliefs in repressed memories that existed. So uh, that is the concept of repressed memory as we know it, and that is how we forget uh, things that we've learned.